I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, and I'm joined today by Graham Bishop, who's a financial commentator and uh, analyst. And he's recently written for the Federal Trust a very important piece um, on the effects of Brexit for the City of London. Uh, I hope you enjoyed his um, presentation and the conversation we're going to have afterwards. Uh, I hope also that you'll find of interest the material which is on the Federal Trust website. Uh, Graham, five minutes perhaps to summarise the very important piece that you've written, recently written for us. Yeah. Thank you, Brendan, for that kind introduction. Yes, um, what I did to start with was to try and identify where Britain's uh, or the United Kingdom's and the European Union's interests will diverge. Um, the, the simple point that I think a lot of people in the UK fail to realise is that the European Union has set out exactly what its interests are, well, since the beginning, um, since the very beginning. It's, it's all the, the sort of peace and security and how to do it, and with that comes the single market, and after that comes the need for the euro. Um, and the interest of the European Union is in making all that work. By contrast, the Boris Johnson government seems to take the view that the UK's interests are nothing but a series of economic transactions. And that, I think, is a bit, uh, well, to say the very least, narrow. So the EU, let's be clear, um, the system of governance there is that the Commission is elected by the European Parliament, directly elected, and the unanimity of the heads of state, and the, therefore the governments. And there is a manifesto in British terms for 2019 to 2024. And that sets out what it's going to do in financial services. And it's very comprehensive. And it, they're setting out to do it. That's exactly what the administration does, as you would expect the civil service to do here. And the results of all this, I think, over a period, will be to whittle away the um, tax revenues from the city. And these are very large. And people, uh, the City of London Corporation produces their annual report, they're, now, they're just on their 13th, I think it is, showing that in 2020, the City of London contributed, well, the financial services industry as a whole, contributed 76 billion <clears throat> pounds of tax revenues. That's actually 76 followed by nine zeros. I had to check that very carefully, I have to say. Uh, nine zeros. So that's a bit stupefying to most people, but let's boil this down to something very simple. If half of that is lost, just for sake of argument, that to replace it would require something, uh, a very substantial tax increase. And that would be, if you put it all on the basic rate of income tax, it would have to go from 20 to 28p. That really, matters to everyone across the UK. It's not just a few city bankers being hit with a surcharge or something. That would matter to everyone across the country. And this is the magnitude of what is being lost by the way this trade and cooperation agreement is actually being um, implemented, negotiated to start with and then implemented. So that's, that's the outline of what I'm trying to demonstrate. Let me ask you a question about that. Um, in the yes. trade and cooperation agreement, there wasn't much reference to services and particularly not to financial services. Um, can you take us forward a bit? Uh, where are we now on the, on, on the negotiations after the trade and cooperation agreement? Well, uh, the, the, the thing is 1,200 and something pages long, and I think there were about six pages on financial services, four articles, so pretty well nothing. Um, <clears throat> there is to be a, a memorandum of understanding, an MOU negotiated, uh, and a lot of people, well, I think they're rapidly changing their mind, but used to think this was going to be when equivalence was granted to, to, to the city. Um, but actually, when you read it, <clears throat> all it boils down to is the mechanics of how to um, conduct regulatory discussions and dialogues and I suppose they'll have the emails and the mobile phone numbers of all the relevant officials and ministers. But that's the sort of thing it is. It's not going to be something to do with granting equivalents. That, the penny is now dropping in the UK. Uh, and so that's going to be completed in, in March at some stage. And that should be quite a serious signal to people that they're not going to get equivalents. Can you say a bit more about this technical term equivalence? Um, 
when we were full members of the European Union, we had financial passporting. Yes. <clears throat> Equivalence is something different, uh, and I think it's worth um, drawing out the difference. Between yes, the yes, two. you're right, it is. Um, passporting was the unconditional right to do the, the business you were authorised to do in the UK, anywhere else. Um, and you didn't have to have um, set up uh, a business there to do it. Equivalence um, is set out in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, and just specifies that um, once you've taken into account the laws and the mechanics of uh, implementing it, you finish up with the same outcome. But, and this is the but, this is at the unilateral discretion of the European Commission alone, not even the Parliament or the Member States, it's the Commission's discretion, and it can be withdrawn in 30 days. So if you're thinking of creating and spending a lot of money on renting a building and moving a load of staff to Frankfurt or Paris, wherever, um, you have to think about whether that business could be stopped at 30 days notice on a unilater unilateral decision by the European Commission. It's quite a, quite a risk. So if I understood you properly, um, we've lost financial passporting and we may not even have a, a great deal of financial equivalence. Uh, can you spell out for me a little more clearly um, how that will impact on the ability of British firms to provide services and therefore generate profit profits from their EU business? Well, yes, if you don't have equivalence, <clears throat> then you will have to set up uh, in the other country um, but let's just say Frankfurt for the moment, uh, though the exchanges have gone to Amsterdam and so on. But uh, so you set up your new bank in Frankfurt and the regulators there, uh, if it's a large bank, it'll be the single supervisory mechanism, have laid down, insisted that you have the staff there to run the whole thing properly uh, with the, um, all the back office staff, the risk management, the compliance officers, everything so it's a real operation and so that is a big uh, effort a costly effort and my point is now that <clears throat> as things move along once this is once a, a bank has sunk that cost they're not going to take it back and sort of unwind it and throw that cost away so uh, gradually i think equivalence will lose any significance because the the firms will already have taken steps to avoid the issue by establishing themselves in the eurozone uh, in the eu but for the purposes of the euro in the eurozone uh, and that is going to mean that um equivalence will rapidly fade away as being of any great significance i had the impression that within the city and uh, ministers um, who are concerned with these things um, there's a more pessimistic you might say a more realistic view um, of what's going to happen to financial services um, over the past six months, say. Um, am I right in that? And what's led to this um, reassessment, do you think? Well, you're right. There is a reassessment. The, the penny is dropping. That This is a unilateral thing by the Commission, uh, this equivalence, and they're not going to grant it. And the, the more we go on about, uh, and the Chancellor has told Parliament, we're going to have different sets of rules and we're going to have agile rulemaking rather than the cumbersome EU system. The more we're going to exploit that, then there will be the divergence and we will shoot off over here. <clears throat> and so the whole uh, equivalence thing will gradually fade away. And I think the city is beginning to realize that. And I, I suspect they are telling ministers that's going to be the case. Can, can you tell me a bit more about how this divergence will work? Um, aren't there various international agreements to which the United Kingdom is party? Ah. And, and how will the, this divergence go down mm. with the city anyway? Well, that's, now you touch on a, an interesting point. Um, we have promised in the TCA, though our Britain's promise is worth very much nowadays. Anyway, we have promised, or in the process of promising, that we will use our best endeavours to stick with the international standards from the Financial Stability Board and the Basel Committee and so on and so forth. Um, when all these were turned into EU law, because that's what happens as a sort of overarching principle at the international level, and then it's turned into details of EU law. When that happens, of course, we were part of the International Forum, Basel Committee, and we then um, were active in ECOFIN and so on in creating, you know, turning that into directives, the Capital Requirements Directive and so on. So 
we're, we have promised to use our best endeavors to stick with those standards. And I find it quite difficult to imagine how we're going to, those standards aren't changing. So how are we going to change our rules using our agile rulemaking and still remain um, compliant with those standards? Uh, it's difficult to see. Will the EU um, suffer from uh, an estrangement in the financial services field between the United Kingdom and the EU? There was a view that um, this might be one area in which genuinely they need us at least as much as we need them. Well, um, you can look at all sorts of different aspects. Um, share, the trading of shares, which is not a very profitable business in its own right. Uh, the trading in EU shares has moved to Amsterdam in, I think, about a week, something like that, after the beginning of the year. Um, so that, that's happened, and it's, as far as I'm aware, the, uh, nobody's complaining that the shares are being uh, less traded, and, and in fact, they're being traded exactly as they were before, but in a different place. So there's no cost to the EU on that. Um, derivatives are a different matter, uh, and derivatives, of course, are the um interest rate derivatives in particular uh, the big thing which is a massive massive business but located in the city of london at the moment now what has happened uh, and i won't go into the technicalities is that a significant amount of it has migrated from the city to new york uh, that's including euro denominated swaps um you could easily argue that dollar denominated stuff should have been in new york anyway so it could be that the EU will be losing a bit out of that. The tax revenues which arise from derivatives traders uh, will be located, will finish up in New York then rather than anywhere else. The one thing is they won't be in the UK. Um, <clears throat> will this really be uh, a reduction in the substantial liquidity of European euro denominated markets, which will therefore raise the costs? Um, there may be, there may be some. But uh, I remember in the days of the referendum, um, people doing estimates that the extra cost might be 25 billion euros. Well, that sounds a lot of money, um, but that has to be set as a percentage of the value of invested assets in the eurozone of 25 trillion, not billion, but trillion. So I can't immediately work out um, the how small that is, how many decimal, uh, how many zeros there are after the decimal point. But it's not significant. It sounds a big number, but against the size of the European economy, I don't see that Europe is really going to pay much of a cost as it stands at the moment. Do you attach any importance, positive or negative, to the um, nomination of David Frost as being in charge of further negotiations? <laughs> well, he was in charge of the cock-up, so I think it's particularly appropriate that he sorts out the mess. In shorthand. Will he be able to sort out the mess? No. Uh, the, no. So the equivalence is gone and will nobody will talk about it in a year maximum, probably six months. And all the, the firms would have been forced to relocate uh, all their uh, substantial bits of business in the Eurozone and they're not going to lose it again. So it's gone. As this political um, and economic um, melodrama unfolds. Do you think it will have any effect on uh, influencing British attitudes towards Brexit? Might it um, give any sort of uh, impetus to ideas that um, we should start thinking about rejoining? Well, um, the idea of a few thousand city jobs disappearing uh, won't make any difference in the red wall seats, I'm sure. What will happen, what will make an impact is if the tax revenues start falling short in the way that I'm suggesting they might begin to, and that's not over a few months or anything, that's a year or two. But if we start seeing the need to do something really radical, I talked about income tax going up. There are other ways, of course, of raising taxes, but every citizen in the UK will notice the hit. And then they will have to think about how did, why has that happened? Uh, and that's when the Brexiteers will have to start answering some very hard questions. And I suspect a lot of people will say, what have we actually gained? We can see what we've lost. Uh, we may have taken back some sort of control, but we've certainly lost a large chunk of tax revenue. 
Are there any other points you want to draw attention to before we conclude this very interesting conversation? I, I will just make one point. Um, everyone in the UK knows that we are the fifth largest economy in the world. Actually, India's probably overtaken us now. But what the British media do not comment on, and this is the core of the problem of dealing with the EU, that the EU is seven times larger population and five times larger GDP. So we're not, yes, we're the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, but we're dealing with someone who's six times our size. And why would they change policy and do anything against their interests um, to help us? Why should they? Why would they? They won't. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting. And uh, I hope viewers enjoyed it.